morning, everybody. Welcome to this very, very first pre-session of the African Green Revolution Forum. I'm very glad that you have all found your way to this virtual HRF. Uh, this is the 10th edition of the African Green Revolution Forum. Uh, but this is, however, the first time we do this virtually. So welcome very much to this session, uh, which we have called Unlocking Sustainable Financing for Africa's Food Systems through SMEs. The theme of this year HRF is Feed the Cities, Grow the Continent. So today, this morning, we will be talking about SMEs that are buying from smallholder farmers, selling into the market, and most particularly selling in urban markets. We will be looking at how these companies are getting financed and how they are sourcing from smallholder farmers and how these two are interacting with each other. I'm joined by a fantastic panel and by a keynote speaker and by a moderator for the Q&A. So um, we will have a full program and I'm very happy that you're all here. Um, let me not take more time and let me introduce you to the first keynote speaker, who is Sarah Mbago Buno, uh, who is the director for East and Southern Africa Division in IFAD. Uh, she joins us from Rome, I think, where IFAD is based, the headquarters. So Sarah, please introduce us to the topic of this morning. The floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you very much, Hedwig. Um, session participants, ladies and gentlemen, fellow panelists, I would like to start my scene setting by thanking AFSEM, Safin, and AGRA for the organization of this uh, all important session, Unlocking Sustainable Finance for Africa Food Systems through SMEs, uh, and inviting me to set the scene. Um, my name is Asaram Bagobunu, as Hedwig has already introduced me, and I'm the Regional Director for Eastern and Southern Africa for the International Fund agricultural development. I would like to say that we at the International Fund for Agricultural Development, like many of the other international financial institutions and the wider UN family, are convinced that the investments in the food economy are catalytic entry points for promoting sustainable development, financing inclusive post-COVID green recovery food systems could realize multiple returns, particularly for higher social human environmental and economic returns. The objectives of this session will enable us to understand the opportunities found in the food economy across Africa, the critical role played by SMEs and the challenges they face. Our esteemed panelists will share business models that have worked and offer blueprints that can be scaled up, replicated to leverage opportunities found in urban food markets and on the wider food system in Africa. This session will place emphasis on two pivotal issues, uh, market integration and access to finance. So just, just, as, just as a way of starting, what is the challenge? Uh, basically our challenge, and I think this is important uh, for Africa, but also the world, is to feed 1.5 billion uh, and potentially 2 billion people by 2030 and 2050 respectively. And uh, this, this, this challenge is one that Africa, I do believe is capable of meeting, um, but it's not a simple run of, run of the ball. Uh, it's not simply a matter of how much food is needed, and the amount of agricultural growth that is required. It's a little bit more complex than that. We have to look at how we're going to have the right nutrition outcomes, how we're going to invest uh, sustainably for transformation for the food economy. And uh, many African countries right across the continent will have to decide on what agricultural growth model they're going to engage in. Um, and to do all of this uh, sustainably, meaning protecting our natural resources and biodiversity, uh, looking at land uh, and understanding regulation and settlements, also looking at endemic inequalities and, and such as differences around gender. So these pathways are really, really important um, and, and the food economy is the entry point. Uh, so what have we seen? Uh, basically, we've seen a rapid expansion of cities. Uh, over the last decade, we have seen about 345 million Africans move to urban centers. And this will potentially double to 600 as we, as we go forward. And the drivers uh, of this the, uh, the growth in population, rapid urbanization has resulted in increased demand for food. Uh, and, and, and this is a really big opportunity. And if I want to deep dive 
into what it looks like in West Africa. Um, the, the food economy, the competitiveness of it is very, very important. Uh, right now it's about uh, 770 billion. And it's roughly 36% of uh, regional GDP. Uh, and for Ghana, uh, for instance, back in 2010, it was already worth 32 billion. Um, so, and it basically the domestic food economy now is 16 times larger uh, than Africa's agricultural export sector. So this warrants us to look and deep dive to see what, what scope it has there. Who, who, are the, who are the actors of the food economy? And I think that's really, really important. Today, we see that the food economy is not only about smallholder producers. Uh, they are a key and important part, uh, but increasingly we see that in fact, the wider food economy is employing about 54% of the population in Nigeria, we see 77% of the population in, in Niger is being uh, in, employed by the food, wider food economy. And today, 60% of the food economy is in the hands of smallholder farmers. So they are very big and important stakeholder group. But 40% is in all the other value chain activities. So retailing, transport, packaging, distribution, uh, even the food uh, vending business, food sector, food delivery and catering. Um, if we deep dive into how this looks like from, uh, let's say, a Nigeria perspective, food and catering is 2%, 58% uh, of the jobs are in farming, so 13 million uh, smallholder farmers are employed in there, 8% is in food processing, and uh, the rest, 19 million jobs are in related marketing and retail. So when we see this, what does it mean? It, it, it brings up a number of questions. It begs us the question to say, finance to unlock and to help SMEs grow and expand and improve and innovate is absolutely essential. So what are the challenges that the SMEs are, uh, are facing now? Uh, well, SMEs often face the challenge of poor regulations. It makes it very difficult for them to actually open up businesses. We know that they are major employers. We know that they have cash flow and liquidity challenges. We also know that they basically have real challenges in um, even having a social security, the ability to pay their workers. Uh, today with the COVID crisis, this, all of these challenges have actually been uh, impounded. So we see that they're not able, basically, some of them have completely closed down, closing down the points of sales. They're not able to source the supplies that they originally needed. They're not able to maintain the cost of doing business, mainly the salaries, the taxes, the rent. And um, they have disruptions in, in, their supply, in, in the supply chain. And uh, they, 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 they no longer are able to carry those bills. Some of them have taken on loans and even to service those loans becomes a challenge. And so it's imperative for us, and I think the panelists will uh, expand uh, around that. Before COVID, there was about an approximate 300 billion funding gap for SMEs. And um, with COVID, of course, uh, that becomes more critical uh, to access and leverage. So what type of finance do SMEs need? Uh, basically, finance for them is around the value chain, so for logistics, uh, to source inputs, uh, also for operational uh, purposes, as we discussed. They are generally in the agricultural sector, not the, not the easiest to, to, to find financing because they face huge issues around risk. So many commercial banks are not necessarily able and willing to provide for them. Many banks as well don't necessarily understand the agricultural cycle and uh, the agricultural business. So uh, aside from them not being able to easily access finance, they also, many of them, don't necessarily have the ability to demonstrate what their data and what their businesses do. Many of them keep books. Many of them would like to demonstrate that they make the necessary margins. But without assistance, without technical assistance and without support, 
they're not able to do that. So our steam panelists today are going to describe models for financing SMEs, which is absolutely critical at this stage. Their models are looking at inclusion, how SMEs can buy from smallholder farmers and supply markets in urban areas. They're going to show the services, the essential linkages that SMEs play. And they're going to, to, to basically build up the case as to why we need to finance this essential group, which is providing us an essential service during this challenging time. So um, without much more ado, I would like to just stop there and hand over uh, back to, 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 to Hedwig, who will then um, invite the other panelists to come forward with their financing solutions and uh, discussing how markets are, are places that need support. Thank you, Hedwig. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks very much for introducing the topic to us that we are discussing this morning. Uh, I realized I had not introduced myself. Uh, my name is Hedwig Sievertse. I'm the head of inclusive finance in Agra, uh, replacing my colleague Ones, who is the head of markets. But I think we are really at the cross section um, of finance and markets. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, my other uh, panelists here for this morning. Um, let me start uh, by Elizabeth. Elizabeth Kigebe from Kenya uh, is the founder and director of uh, Mohogo Foods, which is a company that processes cassava roots into flour and crisps. Um, then we have uh, just joined us, so let me start with the other speakers. Um, Deji, Deji Balogun from Nigeria, uh, the managing director of AFEX, which is a community and commodity exchange platform where innovative finance and marketing comes together. Then we have Edward Isingoma, who is a managing partner of Pearl Capital Partners based in Uganda. Uh, investing in agribusinesses um, for a long time already. So he will lead us through some innovative financing models and companies uh, that are necessary to make uh, value chains work. And the last speaker I would like to introduce is Aisata Diakite. She is the founder and director of Zaban Holding in Mali and France, and Zaban is a company and a fair trade brand of fruit juices, herbal teas, and natural gems made from fruits in Mali. Uh, so welcome all. Uh, I think we have a fantastic panel to take us through the issues of this morning, which is innovative financing for companies that source from smallholder farmers. Um, Maybe the first question for all of you, uh, for the four of you, and maybe you take about three minutes, is to introduce your company and to explain how sourcing from smallholder farmers works for your company. So please, uh, Elizabeth, if you can go first, ladies first. Um, and after that, Deji, Edward, and we close with Isetta. So please, Elizabeth, introduce your company and explain to us how you make sure that smallholder farmers can Feed the city. Okay, cool. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Hedwig. Um, as Hedwig has said, uh, our company in our company we process cassava tubers into affordable and nutritious uh, gluten-free flour, and we also process cassava crisps. So right now we are purchasing from around uh, 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 around six thousand smallholder farmers in Kenya. So uh, these farmers, obviously, as we know, most of the farmers are exploited by middlemen and uh, they exploited of their profits because they don't have a reliable market. So what is Mohoko Foods we are doing? We are coming in as, a, as, as the market for the farmers. So we train them on how to farm the cassava tubers and we also train them on how to, on, on how to, 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 to take care of their farms. And after that, uh, we provide them with a market uh, for, for their produce. And by providing them with a market, I mean that we buy the, all their produce, um, all their produce from, from, from their farms. And cassava is a drought resistant, resistant crop and it's a perennial crop. So um, it's, it's, it doesn't have any seasons. So it's available throughout the year. So um, 
we also provide these farmers with the seed because most of them are not used to farming cassava. So the moment we introduce cassava, we don't just introduce uh, the farming and leave them uh, without a seed. So we just give them the seed and just make sure that, uh, that uh, we also have seed entrepreneurs. So farmers who are also entrepreneurs to be able to sell seeds to other farmers who, who, who are already uh, in the value chain. And um, from these farmers uh, that we are sourcing from, at least we have been able to see an increase in their household revenue. So we can, we can be able to ascertain that since we started working with them in 2017, that is when the company was formed, to now we can see like a rise in the, in the household income and we can see like a change in actually their, their, the way they, they, these farmers are living. So they are able to afford to take their children to school. They can build better houses and they can, uh, they, they can also reinvest uh, their profits in other businesses apart, apart from cassava. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. Very interesting company. 6,000 farmers in three years. I think that's already a big achievement. Uh, over to you, uh, Deji, from uh, AFAX, Comm Commodity Exchange in Nigeria. Welcome. Thank you very much, Edwig. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great morning and I'm um, happy to be here. Uh, so we, when we look at AFAX, we sort of take it. So what we do at AFAX is primarily at the intersection of access to market and access to finance. And uh, so we take a view from the farm to the factory and we look at what are the challenges that are impeding both access to market and access to finance. Um, and we choose those, you know, using very strongly the 80-20% rule, looking at these problems that are fewer, but have the biggest challenges, but we can also have a capacity to provide solutions at scale. Uh, our model is very light cost to the farmer. So we rely very heavily on scale to be able to then break our revenue. So, uh, you know, what we do is to look at it. So first is around uh, financing. Input financing is one of the biggest challenges um, to farmer. Theoretically, about one in 300 farmers in Africa get access to finance. So we provide production finance. We also provide warehouse receipt financing that enables them delay sales um, and, and increased income. The second part is then storage because it's only when you can store and ensure the uh, integrity of the underlying product are you able to then sell it finally to the final user and ensure that when it gets to the final consumer it is traceable healthy and have all those good attributes that is needed uh, so storage is one very critical point it's also the point where we then engage and build the relationships with the community with the farmer first uh, cooperative development, peer-to-peer uh, -peer support between the communities that we work on. Uh, the third part of the solution that we provide is then finally the markets. Uh, because if you look at it, you know, the conundrum between finance and markets is that if you don't have markets solved, you know, nobody can finance you upstream. And, uh, you know, if you don't increase the yields to a point where the farmer starts to make money uh, and it's sustainable, then you don't have enough volume to market. So, Really, you know, we look at this view simultaneously and try to provide solutions uh, to farmers. Thank you, Deji, for introducing uh, AFEX to us. And uh, we will get back to you later for more deeper questions on the financing. I think we're already seeing that SMEs are the key intermediary between farmers and markets. And I think it's very interesting that this morning we have several speakers that look at it from different angles, but are, that are all trying to link farmers to urban markets. Uh, Edward, uh, you're a managing partner in Pearl Capital Partners. You have the funding that many people are talking about. Uh, please take us through some of the issues that you encounter when farmers want to get better access to markets and what that means for the SMEs you're trying to finance. Good. Thanks, Cedric. Um, yes, uh, Pearl Capital Partners, we are an agri-focused fund management business and um, have been doing this now for 15 years and well into our fourth uh, agri-focused impact fund, um, uh, Yield Uganda Investment Fund, uh, uh, where uh, we are looking at SMEs in Uganda. 
So Yield Uganda is a fund that is a single sector, single country focused fund. And so we are looking at SMEs in the agri sector in Uganda and uh, with emphasis on uh, smallholder farmer engagements as our uh, impact focus model. So we are looking to deploy capital in SMEs. We've already deployed um, uh, capital in seven um, uh, agri SMEs in Uganda over the last three years under this fund. And uh, in this fund, uh, uh, we also look to measure how the smallholder farmers actually get impacted either through reven uh, increase in revenues for them and their produce and also uh, 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 increase in engagements and commercialization for those smallholder farmers. Of course, like all other speakers have spoken, the, the, the model does involve quite a lot, but financing for the SMEs and in turn for the smallholders is a key ingredient in, in the value chain. And so we de then um, um, deploy capital to the SMEs and by deploying capital into SMEs and allowing them to grow, we are able to increase uh, engagement with smallholder farmers, uh, both providing market and also providing capacity building through uh, business development services support at SME level and at smallholder farmer level through think models that involve things like outgrower systems and setup of schemes that involve um, getting uh, the, the smallholders together to access market and or even better negotiate as Elizabeth and um, EODG just mentioned. So yes, we, we, we intervene through engagements with the smallholders and funding them for growth. Yes. Thanks, Edward. I, I think that's something we see across the board in, in many countries. It's that SMEs, in fact, are one of the main financiers of smallholder farmers, right? It's yeah. not so much the financial institutions that interact with farmers, but it's more the SMEs that want to buy from farmers that need to invest in them growing the produce the SMEs need to offtake uh, and to bring to the market. So it's interesting that SMEs becoming more and more banks, maybe. So I think that's an interesting uh, topic that we can discuss later on uh, when we are going deeper in the topic. Um, I would like to introduce our last uh, speaker panelist. Um, it's a bit of a tricky thing because we haven't done the dry run. Iseta, you've just joined us. Uh, I hope you can hear me. I hope uh, we can also see you uh, mm -hmm. later on. Uh, so welcome, introduce your company, Saban, uh, mm -hmm. from Mali to us um, and explain to us how you're sourcing from smallholder farmers to run your company. Okay. Thank you to invite me. Sorry, I can't open my videos because uh, I am at home and I have my babies with me. Um, I'm going to talk about Zaban. A uh, Zaban company we start in uh, 2015 in uh, Mali. Um, Zaban works uh, about uh, valor chain. In the Zaban works with uh, 2005 product product farmers around the Mali and uh, include 20 to 20,000 women. Um, we, we meeting uh, collect because uh, many of our uh, run materials are uh, wild. Uh, an example, Zaban, Baobab, Tamarang, Kinkeriba. Um, we talked five years to structure our uh, network farmers in uh, uh, in Mali or on to Mali but uh, to financing that Zaban uh, spend a lot of money uh, but the, 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 the local banks in, in, in Mali really don't uh, support in the private sector to financing a small uh, producer in, in this also we, we make a um, Agriculture and equitable association like uh, Zaban Equity. She she manage the our network of farmers in Mali. A, uh, the association uh, also work with uh, public and private sec projects. We, we we have works uh, um, this years with uh, the, the national units on uh, three sectors in the region of Mopti, like uh, Kinkeliba, Tamarin, and Baobab. Mm, we have uh, 17 
branches in the Mali. Uh, and finally, actually in Japan, our, our network is a uh, really our, um, our strength in the network of Pharma. Um, and the company, we make uh, juice, jams, and uh, herbized tea for our local markets, and uh, we export to our, also in uh, Europe markets. If I will, I will go into financing. Um, today we have uh, really need to pass in uh, online net, net you with uh, thank years of uh, industry production. We need to uh, scale up to better serve to uh, ECOWAX market. We need to spline and uh, string out the factory. Um, investing fund in do not um, provide must support the human uh, and young people. But I am uh, strong to, to see that accompanying uh, projects uh, on all older people's papers will uh, are eighty percent failure on uh, the, the continent. We are finding, sorry. <laughs> and, There's no problem, and... Isaac. Uh, we'll come back to you uh, also when we start to dig a bit deeper into the finance. So okay. it's okay, we, we, you have introduced your company and it, I find it very interesting that you have created a second company just to mm -hmm. take care of the finance because the financial market in Mali is not enabling for you. So I think we have already seen four very interesting models where the different mm -hmm. SMEs have chosen different models to get financing to the farmers. So we'll get back to you later, Isata, when we talk deeper onto the financing challenges you have. Okay. So Thank you very much. I would like to say to the audience, if you have questions, comments, things you would like to know from the speakers, please put them in the chat box. And when we get to the Q&A session, uh, we'll invite you to, uh, we will invite the Q&A moderator to pick your questions and to get them answered. So please continue to type your questions in the chat box, which you can find on the lower end of your screen. Uh, and then we'll, we'll get back to you uh, when we are uh, past the next session. So the next uh, part of this discussion will be to have a bit deeper discussion with each of the panelists about their financing. So maybe to start with uh, Elizabeth, um, I think it's interesting for us to hear why you are sourcing from smallholder farmers because it's not the easiest thing to do, right? There are many, they're scattered, they don't have financial resources to invest in their farms, et cetera. So the first thing uh, we would be interested to know is why do you source from small scale producers? And what does that mean for the investability of your company? So what type of investments do you need to scale your companies? And so that more small scale farmers that you work with can feed the cities. So why do you source from smaller farmers and how investable is your model based on that fact? Because most banks, most financial institutions would see that rather as a risk that you source from smaller farmers. So for us, it would be interesting to learn. Maybe it is an advantage for you right, to source your funding. So Elizabeth, five minutes for you to give us your secret. Okay, cool. Let me give you my secrets. So uh, you asked, why do I source from smallholder farmers? So when I started uh, the company, I had that the passion to do cassava flour. And um, when I looked around, in Kenya, we don't have large-scale cassava, um, cassava farmers. And so what I did, I started looking for farmers, any farmer with cassava. And then I went to different um, to, to, to different uh, organizations that deal with farmers. And at least I got an organization that uh, showed me a group of farmers that had already been organized and they had uh, very sm small pieces of land uh, with cassava. And that's where I started, I started working with them. So uh, the way we work 
with pharmacies that we organize them into pharma groups. So then the pharma groups are in uh, groups of between 100 to 400 smallholder farmers. That means when they are a group, they are, they are able to come together and, 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 and also uh, maybe do some, something like table banking, invest uh, between themselves, because obviously it's very hard for a bank to believe in a smallholder farmer and give them a loan. So what we encourage these farmers is that they should, um, they, they should work uh, with table banking, where they where they save money uh, in in uh, within the groups and also lend uh, between each other. So if a farmer doesn't have uh, same money for 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 the seed, then they can go and borrow from the from the farmer group and then return the money with an interest. So how that's how we work with the smallholder farmers, and. Um, so far, uh, we continue working with smallholder farmers that have less than two acres of land. And right now, the reason why we are still uh, sourcing from smallholder farmers, it's because the smallholder farmers are easily trainable and, and they can easily adjust with, with, with the changing with the changing times of the changing varieties of the different cassava uh, tubers that we are looking for. And that's why we are going for the smallholder farmers. And also apart from that, we want to make an, an impact. We want to make their lives better so that we don't have, uh, right, now, right now currently you would see that say more than 60% of smallholder farmers in Kenya are poor. So what? how can we contribute to reducing poverty among the smallholder farmers? And the only way we can contribute is by working closely with them, giving them that market and also maybe uh, eliminating uh, the middlemen and also reducing their post harvest losses and also equipping them with different skills not just farming skills but but also other entrepreneurial skills in that there's business there's continuity of earning and there's continuity of business even after Mohoka Foods even if Mohoka Foods is not on, on the ground I believe that the smallholder farmers that you're working with Will continue earning more and more from different uh, from 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 different uh, entrepreneurial skills that we have uh, trained them on. And you also asked um, how investable is the model. I think um, this model is highly investable. So so far within the three years. We've, uh, we've, we've worked with these smallholder farmers uh, without a, having any, any external investment from other investors. Yes, we've had a few, uh, we've had one loan from, from, a, from a local microfinance bank, but you can imagine how scalable that this can be if Mogo Foods alone can, 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 can get up to over 6,000 smallholder farmers. Now imagine how much we are able to achieve if we got the external investment that we are looking for currently. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I think uh, the, what I find very interesting is that you say smallholder farmers are more agile, right? More easy to react to new circumstances, which makes your model more robust, maybe as a company. So that, that's a very interesting uh, finding for me. And also the, the support to table banking, right? So that farmers have their own systems. Uh, they often have saving and credit associations, village savings and loans associations, that these ones are really the, the, the type of vehicles that get financed to farmers. And that also makes it easier for the SME to then deal, not to have to deal with internal financing of farmers. Um, I think, um, Deji, I, I want to come to you um, with a bit of a similar question, right? So why why do you choose to work with, with smallholder farmers, which is often not the easiest, although we have just learned from Elizabeth that uh, agility might be an, a good advantage and an impact, of course, uh, which I think we all find obvious. Uh, but I think it's good to hear other um, um, assets that smallholder farmers have compared to maybe commercial farmers or larger scale farmers. So um, again, for you also sourcing from smallholder farmers, why and what does it mean for the investability of your company? Over to you, Deji. Thank you, Edric. So first, primarily because there are no other people to work with. <laughs> primarily 98% of our foods are, are, are produced by smallholder farmers. So, you know, you know, we could count by our hands the number of uh, large-scale farmers we have in Nigeria, and it's similar for the rest of Africa, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, thinking out South Africa and maybe Zimbabwe, so, so uh, Zambia rather these days. So again, so that's the first reason. So primarily the producers of food are small, um, you know, so we choose our band. We work with above one hectare. So farmers that 
primarily are not producing food just for consumption. So they are ready to produce for the market. That's where we start from. And then we go and the aim is to really help them grow, you know, both in yield and on farm size over a three to four uh, uh, um, year span. The second is that if you look at if what we've learned, you know, in, in the five, six years, uh, building this model out from Rwanda, Kenya, and in Nigeria primarily, um, is that if you're able to take a view of service rather than products, you start to convert the, it from transactions to relationships. So, so you create value for the farmer, you're, you're invested in, in, and then it allows you to then earn revenue from multiple points over the course of the year. So I could take a view and just sell inputs to the farmer and buy commodity, which is good in and of itself, right? But then if I have a view that says, look, I'm invested in this guy, I'm providing the support he needs to increase his value, uh, both in volume produced, but also in price it can earn, right? So I start to earn from um, value chain services, which is a service-based fee, I start to earn from the financing that I unlock for him. I start to earn from the inputs that I provide to him that I earn from the storage when it harvests, maybe make an post harvest services in between. And then I earn when it eventually sells. And effectively it earns a whole lot more than it earned without me. But I also just move from two different revenue points to five. So it makes business sense when you can do this, particularly when you can do it at scale. The third part of it is that, um, you know, you know. So, sorry, the last part of that is that then they stay with you. So when they see value, farmers are a very loyal customer segment. So when they see value, they stay with you over time. So you have one guy and he markets to 10 guys and each of those guys on the third year market to another 10 guy. So your marketing cost is pretty much zero because they just scale by word of mouth by themselves. Um, and then they stay with you. So you have a one year down year, traders are off your back, you know, they move on. Uh, but farmers stay with you and then you recover and you build. So it gives a resilience business model. The third part is it's scalable. So the guy, when I start working with him, uh, does two tons, you know, 20 bags of maize or, or soya beans. And in the second or the third year, he's doing five tons. You know, it's growing to 10 tons if you can increase his land size. So you know, it then means more business for me in that location. So, you know, you can't work with a trader. A trader can't grow scale five times in two, three years, but a farmer can. So the question is, how do you build models that allow you reach a lot of farmer at a positive contribution margin? Uh, once you crack that, it's, it's a very good segment to play in. And how about the investability of the model? I mean, how does it what does it mean for Apex as a company to attract funding? I mean, is it is it a positive thing? Is it uh, is it a negative thing? Um, how, what does it mean this model, this service delivery model, in fact, as you as you put it, uh, which I find it a very interesting uh, way of putting it. Right? It's not like farmers are uh, this annoying uh, suppliers of my raw produce. No, they are my customers and I'm Sorry. delivering a service to them and they are paying me for that. Sorry. I think it is that I can understand that it might be a difficult model to sell to an investor, right? Because it, it's it's a bit of a different uh, mindset. Maybe you can... Yeah, it's, it, you know, you know Edwig, and we've been on this journey for, for together for, for quite a while. So, you know, what, what do we then look today? Uh, you know, just understanding the model and doing a lot of work and also with the support of Agra being able to sort of, you know, get additional resources, just think through what has worked and what hasn't worked very critically. So when we look at investments in business, we look at it in two folds. So one is investing in FX as a business to finance our operations. And what is, how, how do we then and also to finance our growth. So, you know, five years of doing this were well, the points where we need to really scale if it works. Um, so that's one part of, of the problem we need to solve. The second part is how do we unlock financing for these smallholder farmers and how can that scale? Now, where the two of them are linked is that only when I scale, you know, in volume and the number of reach of farmers. So we're now at the 100,000, 110,000 smallholder farmers uh, that we reach directly. It's only when we really scale that we then start to then make the business model work 
and then have positive returns that then allow us to attract funding for that side. Now, what we've done is that, um, so we've, you know, five years ago when we started, we started with microfinance lending to the smallholder farmers. And, you know, they have the legwork. It's an expensive source of funding, but then they have the legwork to and reach the farmer. So it's, you know, then their risk tolerance is sort of lower than, than other financial providers. So that was a good model at the beginning. As we started to scale beyond 20, 25,000 farmers, then one inherent problem in that sector came up, which was technology. Almost all the microfinance entities are very low tech. Um, so, you know, gathering data, analyzing data, being able to say individual uh, uh, repayment history as the number scale became a problem. So that, that, could, that didn't work anymore. Uh, we had to then look at other things. Luckily, as a commodities exchange, we're part of the capital markets. So what we then do is to sort of securitize transaction. Um, and I'll try and, you know, so, so what we take is we take a thousand farmers producing the same product, the same area. We look at the layers of the risking, you know, insurance, yield based index insurances, uh, maybe credit guarantees where we can get. And then we create this into an investable ticket like a commercial paper. And then we sell this to fund managers and asset managers at a yield, you know, adjusted uh, 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 return. And we've really, really done this very well. So this year, um, we've, 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 we've raised quite a lot of funding for our farmers. We provided finances for about 30,000 farmers. Um, this is, and despite the COVID restrictions, uh, which would have, you know, would have allowed us, we would have done a bit more than that. Um, and that's, that's really that side. Now, once we crack that part, it then makes financing effects actually a lot easier because then the numbers start to work. Thanks a lot, uh, Deji. I think this is a very new type of looking at, at, at getting finance to farmers, right? Uh, and also seeing farmers not only as your suppliers, but also as your customers. Um, I, I want to move to Edward as, as being a financier. Uh, so what, what type of uh, investments uh, have you made that made it easier for farmers to sell into the market? Um, because you, you, have, you have a bit of a different uh, position. Uh, so what models do you see or are you looking for in the market that help small scale producers to access markets? And what do you see as investable and scalable as an investor? Thanks, Edwin. Uh, yeah, uh, I will, I will, so the first question is um, sharing some experiences and some of the models and projects we've invested in um, uh, and what we are seeing. Uh, I'll share very quickly three examples. One is having, as your Deji just mentioned, having once the farmers you have SMEs have relationships with them, then the rest is really about scale and how well they can do. So they will always replicate and 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 and, and, and things like succession planning, children become or farmers becoming farmers themselves, things like that is much easier. But some of the three examples I'd love to share. One is we've invested, we did analyze and believe that many smallholder farmers in Uganda were producing for export, whether it's fish, whether it's vegetables, whether it's fruits, and there was an issue of quality as a challenge. And many times at some point, actually on two or three occasions, the European Union did ban export of fresh fruit and vegetables and fish and things from Uganda because of quality challenges. So what did we do? We thought from an impact investor perspective, we had to solve that quality problem at source. And so we did make an investment to empower and improve capacity of um, the only actually internationally accredited and uh, locally present uh, uh, food laboratory in Uganda. And this was chemical laboratory. So we did make that investment to improve capacity of, uh, in terms of equipment, in terms of technology, in terms of uh, training for, the, for them, and also in terms of um, supporting the business, reach out to smallholders and the SMEs that are doing the exports to appreciate the value of quality uh, uh, control and quality produce uh, for the cities and the markets out in Europe. And this is a key driver in directly changing the whole sector in terms of access to market. Because if you have good produce, quality produce, and it's been verifiable by an international accredited laboratory, then the market 
uh, follows uh, uh, in line. So that's one. The second example I'd love to share, Hedwig, is we, we did, in Uganda, there's a lot, very cheap, low cost input for production of eggs. Um, uh, 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 many smallholder farmers produce eggs, but you know eggs have a short shelf life. And, 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 and so in the end, uh, in the whole of East Africa, there isn't any processor for all these decades of eggs and converting them into increasing the shelf life by value addition, pasteurizing and processing and, and improving quality of, of those eggs. Plus every two, three years, we have bad flu striking. And who, who suffers with bad flu? Once all the chicken and all the eggs can't move up across the cities, it's the smallholder farmer. They've got to throw away the eggs. They literally, there's no market. The traders can't access the market, the cities and things. So in the end, um, we did then believe there was a solution out there. And so we've also invested in a business called Pristine Foods, which does a value addition to eggs. And as part of our investment, because this investment is not um, uh, costing them the same way a commercial bank would have costed them, we have required them to actually source 60% of their uh, raw materials of eggs from smallholders those who are owning less than 500 bats and backyard uh, 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 smallholders. And th what does that mean? That then means it is a whole new market for those smallholders. They're able to, and even when there are times when um, there's bad flu, they will still be able to make cells because the eggs are then processed, are pasteurized. The problem of, uh, of, of scarcity is then managed through the fact that there is value addition and quality control on those eggs as they get to the market. And, and that is uh, a game changer because it's the first of its kind in East Africa. And as you've all mentioned, many of these other commercial banks or other financing models that are not impact oriented would not have done that type of investment. Of course, two years in, yes, we're seeing interest from commercial banks to come into the sector. So, so, so that is the second example of something that we've done that gives smallholder farmers access to market. And in both, um, uh, in the third and final example is where many of the projects we have invested in, in coffee, Sekofa, um, in Clark Farm, in Raintree, we are going with uh, interesting models where we are using our BDS service uh, grant from the EU and IFAD to actually support these SMEs, automate, as Adeji just mentioned, if you're working with five, 10 smallholders, it's okay. You can maintain the records in a black book, an exercise book, and it's, it's all right. But when they get to 10,000 smallholder farmers, these SMEs are going to struggle. How do you educate them? How do you mentor them? How do you train them? How do you communicate with them? How do you get those things going? And so in the end, we are saying, look, we have a BDS facility. We're able to work with you and support you develop watertight concrete outgrower schemes uh, uh, that are going to be automated and allow, allow that relationship between you and the smallholder farmers to be concretized. So we are seeing that in the coffee, in the certification of the smallholder farmers, in the, uh, in, 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 in the organization of the smallholder farmers, in engagements. And we are also starting to see a few other NGOs like SNV have now come in and gone to one of our investees called Sesako, the soya processor, and said, look, we'll take, do a grant and take on empowerment and capacity building of your smallholder farmers. So, and that for us is very interesting to see in the market. So uh, those are some of the examples. And your second question, Hedwig, was about what models do we see that will be able to drive forward um, um, uh, access to markets for smallholder farmers? There are three or four different models. We believe there's a lot that needs to be done with outgrowers models, uh, warehouse receipt systems and things like that. There's a lot there that is still undone in this country and, and, and in the region. We also believe infrastructure development is necessary. Uh, COVID has been a, a classic example. We've seen uh, the farmers still produced uh, uh, chickens and things, but then the tourist sector was closed, the hotels were closed, What we needed cold chains. So, so those are the models we believe that are going to be uh, uh, interestingly uh, uh, helpful. Market diversifications and value addition, uh, having many of these SMEs doing a little bit more with value addition. Why should we in Uganda still import cornflakes? <laughs> so yet we are having all the cheap 
maize and 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 agro has done a lot with uh, with, with maize and, and 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 all these things so we should have more value additions and then we also think there's a lot that could be done with logistics and 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 and, and moving things around uh, it's interesting we are seeing some of our in our some of our investees the cost of packaging is more expensive than the cost of the ingredients in the packaging and it shouldn't be and who then is suffering it's a smallholder farmer so so with that um i i believe um those are some of the models that we see uh, need focus uh, going forward thank you hedwig very very interesting edward um so to I mean, I've heard from you that uh, if you work with smallholder farmers, you can get a more attractive funding. So that is an, an interesting point, right? You have invested in this Prestine uh, company with the condition that they source from smallholder farmers. So that gives yeah. them access to a more attractive uh, type of funding. Um, what I also heard is that you are investing in order to make life for other for SMEs in the agri sector easier, right? To get quality control systems, to get automation going, and now we need to do much more of that, right? So that doing business for SMEs becomes easier, that packaging becomes uh, cheaper, that there's a cold chain, that there's transport, logistics. I think this is an interesting point uh, to also put to Aisata, the Akite, because she's sourcing fruits from farmers. Uh, so I can imagine that she is typically a person that needs this type of enabling enablers, let's say, for her company to grow. So mm -hmm. Aisata, also for you, the question, uh, what makes it attractive for you to source from smallholder farmers? Uh, because it, it's often not the easiest thing to do. And then as the next question, uh, what is the investability of your model uh, as a BAM company? Uh, do you attract more funding because you source from smallholder farmers or is it more difficult because banks or, or financiers find it more tricky and risky because you work with this uh, unreliable, fragile uh, segment of smallholder farmers? Uh, Aisata, uh, over to you. Okay, thank you. I will answer uh, the both questions. Um, but Zaban needs a really story. Yeah. <laughs> I started when I, I was uh, so young. I was um, I studied uh, agribusiness in France, but I started the project when I was a student and I used to work. So at the beginning, I had uh, really a lot of difficulty to, to access financing, um, but I won the several international prize uh, around the world like uh, 150,000 euros. Um, after when I uh, was in Mali and definitely we went um, in 2000, 2015, sorry. Um, I, I started the factory. I had uh, a guarantee with uh, our uh, guarantee fund in private sector in Mali. Um, I had a contribution of uh, 50,000 euros. And uh, after I contract nearly like um, one 1,000 million with uh, a bank in Mali. Um, to better structure our uh, farmer, I had a uh, grant from uh, the ENCDF for help human and uh, to get the organic um, certification. Sometimes we work with, uh, we work with uh, some organization about uh, um, private and uh, public sectors with our association to, to financing and to help uh, our farmers in Mali. Um, we export around one, one and two, thousand, two tons of juices in uh, by months in France and uh, on this market we work with some restaurants and the shops a uh, one bottle like uh, two euros and uh, actually we are uh, fitting disputing the, the like of uh, finding under our uh, turner corvus or fixing and uh, variable costs. We need to exp to expand our factory and uh, spend the factory. We need long-term cr credit 
to 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 get this product because uh, Zaban has a lot of um, markets, a, a lot of asking from uh, Ivory Coast, from Senegal, from uh, France too. Um, but actually, we work to develop uh, the international markets. Um, next year, we will start to produce our juices in uh, in France um, to work with a big supermarket. Actually, we, 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 I, I talked with, with her, yeah. Um, and uh, for me, we, 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 we must uh, um, um, provide the ability to develop the agriculture sector in Africa, like West Africa. And in Mali, actually, we have a lot of problems, but uh, our entrepreneurs, this private sector um, do more than uh, public sector. An example, actually, my company work with farmers in Mali um, uh, and in Mopti. It uh, run the difficult, but uh, the government in Mali can't work there. But private sector can do that with uh, a small farmer. Um, we, we, we work hard to develop a local economic and uh, we our product, you, is uh, we, we work to some uh, with uh, supermarket and hotels in Mali too. Donc, so this is uh, my uh, my answer with uh, our question. Thanks very much, Salta. Indeed, you you work in a very very challenging environment. Not only COVID, uh, but Mali uh, also has this problem. So it's really amazing how you have been able to to link international markets to a different difficult environment like the Mali in uh, agricultural sector. Mm -hmm. um, I think we, we have really, I mean, I, I found this panel very rich, right? We see so many perspectives and so many different uh, business models. So I, I, think, uh, I think this is a fantastic start of HRF, if I can talk for ourselves. Um, I, I would like to, to have an, an, a, a closing uh, remarks uh, from all of you, uh, because then we have some time left uh, for a Q&A session. I think uh, there has been uh, questions coming through the chat. If you still have questions, please use the chat box. Uh, then we'll, we'll get back to you. So as a closing remark, I would like to hear from all of you, uh, starting with uh, Elizabeth, uh, if she's still here, because I don't see her on my screen. Uh, so let's see whether she's still here. If not, uh, it's Deji. Uh, a closing remark on, on recommendations. What do you see as the biggest bottleneck so that more farmers can feed the cities? I think we've heard some of uh, some ideas already from you, but maybe what would be the first thing you would like HRF to solve for you uh, in order to, uh, to make sure that more farmers can feed the cities? Uh, Elizabeth, if you're here, please talk. Uh, if you're not, then Deji, the floor is then for you. I think it's Deji. Go ahead. Okay. I think Elizabeth has dropped off, unfortunately. Okay, so, um, so, 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 so there, there are three things. And um, our, our view is that these three things have to be solved simultaneously. Um, and in the past, a lot of approach has been so focusing on one of the three, either of any of the three, you know. So one is one is talent and productivity. So you know, we, you know, Africa produces grains at one fifth the yields of you know people, you know, their counterparts around the same agroecological zones. Um, second is access to finance, um, and it's difficult to get access, you know, productivity up, even if you teach the farmer and you teach the the you know without providing the financing to then be able to buy the inputs he needs to finance or to scale his farm. So, you know, and then the third is access to markets. When you fix talent and you fix financing and you don't provide effective market channels, then you have a situation where you have oversupply leading to a glut and prices fall. And then it's back to, to square work. So a lot of times interventions focus on one of these trees and then they do excellent works, but it never gets sustainable. So our view is that we need to create systemic change around these three things simultaneously over time to all to ensure that we then have that multiplier effect and we start to see um, farmers connecting 
knowledge being transferred, productivity being enhanced, and Africa really being able to feed itself over the next few decades. Thanks, Deji. I think that would be a fantastic entry speech for HRF. So thanks for those uh, remarks. Uh, Edward, any thoughts about what do you see as the most critical challenge and, and thing we need to solve in order for more farmers to be able to feed the cities? But I think, um, I believe uh, there are three things. One is financing for SMEs that are actually managing the value chain from supply to the cities. Uh, financing for those SMEs would be a big, a big thing that needs to be solved uh, and the infrastructure involved in that. And then two is the quality of produce. Many times the, 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 there is need to develop capacity and systems and processes. Also to check quality at the smallholder farmer level rather than waiting for staff to arrive in Nairobi or in Kampala and then we have a problem with quality. And then three is um, uh, empowerment. Uh, empowerment of, across the various value chains. I, I, I think there is so many various interventions that are necessary right from uh, start to the end of the value chain. Thank you. Thanks, Edward. Very uh, interesting. Uh, quality, empowerment, and access to finance for SMEs. Um, Iseta, what is for you the most critical thing that needs to be solved in order for more farmers to be able to sell into your uh, international markets? Mm, international market. But I, um, I started to... Or, the, to... or uh, Bamako. It's also fine. <laughs> Okay, um, actually, um, Zaman, when I, I started uh, the business, I uh, started to, to work uh, with uh, some actors in the international market like France, but I know this market. And in Mali, it, uh, it was difficult to get market there too, because um, um, the, the Malian culture don't like to consume local products like uh, baobab juice, all people knows, but all people make that at home. But uh, when I started to, to I, it was difficult to get uh, some contract with uh, supermarket, hotels, but after uh, three years, um, the, 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 the company um, was strong and uh, you get a lot of contract with all supermarkets around uh, the capitals and uh, we open some shelves like uh, some regions but in international market it's a uh, sample to work because uh, our product at a uh, good product the quality is best and uh, actually I contract some uh, with in, oh, with another industrial uh, in France to, 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 to product more because uh, when I, I, I uh, the COVID was difficult for us and uh, actually mm, with uh, our uh, political uh, problematic there in Mali, it's difficult uh, to, 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 to work mm, a lot of, but we have a lot of uh, round Mm, first market for first material, uh, I can export to a uh, really actually I work with uh, this business to develop Zaban in international market. It's gonna be little for it's gonna be um, um, simple for me to do that. Um, and uh, in Mali, we will uh, continue to to work and uh, to, 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 to develop business around the Mali, like Senegal and Cote d'Ivoire. In Cote d'Ivoire, we, we, we will uh, work with uh, Carrefour in Senegal with Ocean, uh, the, in, like December in uh, this year. Thanks very much, Isata. I, I find it a very interesting addition, right? It's the awareness mm. of, the, of the African population that African products can be good and that they that they are as competitive and as good as a quality as, as imported products. And I think exactly. that's an important addition uh, for you. So, I mean, I would like to introduce now Daiborn Chibonga, uh, regional head for Southern Africa for Agra. 
uh, to take us through some questions. I've seen uh, many questions coming through. I hope, uh, Dyborn, you've picked some interesting one for our panel. Over to you, Dyborn. Thank you so much, and thank you for everybody who is on the call. We have a lot of questions with only five minutes to go. But the first one goes to Afex. To please share your early successes in Kaduna in both facilitating access to inputs and markets. One minute, please. Yeah, I think the secret was really to sit down with a farmer and empathize, understand their problem from where they stand, and then try your best to provide a solution for those problems. Uh, we started with a point where we had very high, you know, beautiful models across the world that we wanted to deploy, but we found that we're not solving the problem. So the patients in Cardinal, which was our first success operating across Africa, was really just staying with the farmer, listening patiently, and then designing a solution that works for them. Thank you very much. The others were comments. One comment was that uh, SMEs are the backbone of agri-food sector in Africa. Therefore, they were appreciating this panel. And then for Asieta to share your profile so that people can understand how you created a successful company. And then there are a lot of questions for Pell. Please, in one minute, can you try and answer? And then the other things you can uh, respond by writing. How does Pell provide their business development services to farm organizations? Do they not find this expensive and sustainable and often difficult to manage the quality? And then the one also is on agricultural machinery and equipment. Is that included? And then the next one is the current status with providing business development services in mechanization hire. And then the biggest challenges that you've had because of COVID. And lastly, how to get to scale in terms of SME financing at national scale. And that's for everybody. I think we can answer that one later on. Over to you, Edward. <laughs> Thanks, David. You've taken a minute to read them out. So <laughs> anyway, um, how do we ask, uh, route our BDS support to SME, to the smallholder farmers and, and farmer groups and uh, associations? We do it through the SMEs that we invest in. So our BDS support is all post-investment BDS support. So once we have invested in the SME, we do it through them because the SMEs have relationships with these uh, outgrowers and, 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 and the organization and, and the farmers. Two is um, how do we deal with the challenge of site selling? Yes, one, you, we make sure there's relationships between the SMEs and the smallholder farmers are watertight as much as we can, but also one of the key causes of site selling is when the SMEs run out of working capital or they don't have sufficient working capital in a timely manner. So we solve that through our financing structure for the SMEs. Um, the other question was um, machinery. Yes, we do invest in agricultural equipment and machinery. So that's one of the things that we can invest in in the SMEs uh, at the SME level, not at the smallholder farmer level. Um, COVID impacts, yes, big time challenge. And we've had to do restructurings for our, uh, investments and uh, support them through the COVID uh, uh, engagements. And one of the key inputs that we've done and how to help with the um, uh, liquidity positions is that we've increased our subsidy program from a contribution of 50% on the grant component of BDS to 85% for all of them. And that is very, very helpful for their liquidity situation. Yep, I think that was it. Thank you. That is all the time we have for QA. We will answer some of the questions uh, in writing. Back to you, Edwig. Thanks, uh, Dyborn, for reading through the chat box uh, while uh, we were talking and discussing. I think this was a fantastic session. Uh, as a kickoff, I would like to thank everybody for being an active participant. Uh, also, thanks to Elizabeth, who has uh, unfortunately dropped off. I said that the Akite of Zaban, uh, Deji from Apex, Edward from Pearl Capital. And the final words are for Sarah to do some closing remarks and uh, summarize for us what we have learned in this session. So please, audience, uh, stay on for HRF. It's continuing beyond this session and uh, have a great week. Thank you all. Sarah, over to you to close us out. Thank you, Hedrick. Thank you very much, Hedrick, and thank, thank you. you.
the key takeaway here is that we have to have models. Smallholder farmers are very small in Africa. If we don't get the access to market, integrating the market, bringing the finance together and actually de-risking all of these systems, it won't work. The examples we share today of value chain finance, providing solutions around logistics, providing solutions for sourcing, providing uh, cheaper credit for farmers to actually do the farming, all of those are needed together as a subset. Uh, we need to get an ecosystem of regulations together to underwrite and underpin contracts. Some of the models are looking at contract farming without the right set of regulations to enforce those, that won't work. We heard very interesting models around warehousing and the logistical functions that are able to improve the competitiveness of smallholder produce in Africa for the urban market. And I think this is absolutely necessary. We cannot get the produce as produced by smallholder farmers into our markets in Africa at competitive prices if we don't provide these essential services that these SMEs have been talking about. And I think it's all on us to crowd in the finance that we need for this. So smart partnerships at national level with commercial banks is one way of doing that. Um, crowding in public finance and targeting it in the right areas. I think we heard a lot from Mali to say that SMEs are able to go where government and public sector doesn't go. And I think that for us is a key takeaway. How can we forge smart partnerships with SMEs here presented, fund managers here presented to be able to unlock and leverage the produce that is now currently sitting on smallholder markets and onto the plates of African consumers. I think this is an excellent start, as Hendrik has said, um, to the AGRF. And these are the questions, these are the solutions that we need to scale up. And I look forward to talking to all of you uh, in greater detail around how we can partner, for instance, with uh, IFIs and financial service providers to give you support that you need to be able to reach smallholder farmers uh, right around or across the continent. So uh, thank you, Daibon. Thank you, Edward. Thank you, Hedwig. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Aisata. And uh, good start to, to the AGRF. Thank Aribo, you. Karibu sana. <laughs> Asante sana. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent start.